What is up, everybody? Tis I, the producer slash seducer, Nick Scarpino coming at you hot. Nitro Rifle. I don't know why he does that. Andy. Andy. You can keep it open because I'm probably going to shout at you a lot. Okay. Let's just keep these open. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Well, I'm also probably going to have my headphones on. That's fine. Humidity. But it'll be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey everyone, welcome to uh, the AMA for this month. You pulled me, uh, a lot of you asked some questions for me and I'm here to answer them for you, of course. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Um, we literally could not do any of this without you guys. We thought we'd change it up a little bit. Uh, the guys are in there with Ryan McCaffrey right now filming a, uh, a games cast. And I was like, you know what? I can't wait. I can't wait for this. I need... I need you guys right now. That's what I need. I also need to turn this off because there's a monitor right here that I have that I'm making sure that I'm like in focus and I don't need that shit anymore. We're just gonna go ahead and turn that off. Oh, now I can just focus on you. Isn't that much better? Uh, first question today comes from Audio Tech. Audio Tech says, hey Nick, firstly, thank you for all uh, you do for our community. I'm hoping that you and Kevin can collaborate on this answer. My question is, what are you looking for at your next technical hire? Uh, I have thrown this pitch at you once or twice in the morning show. I've been very lucky in my life. My father did lights for bands anywhere from Rush to Def Leppard, and I grew up always wanting to be more like him. At eight years old, I started uh, volunteering for CT News, Canada's number one news channel. Love how you threw that bad boy in there. Uh, Fifteen years later, I'm still here working as an editor, camera operator, floor director, lighting guy, and recently moved to Winnipeg for a full-time audio uh, operator role. Um, the industry is my life, and I love your content, your crew, and what you stand for. I've been a best friend since IGN, and I hope to be an employee one day. I realize you have a talented editor at Andy, your brother's production team, uh, to build sets. I know your cameras are, are locked off, and Kevin runs the show from his uh, command center, but when the day comes when you have a bigger studio with camera on pedestals, or a jib, a separate technical director, and an audio guy in the control room, it would be a privilege to be part of that. If only to fly out and help build it and maybe chat about our love for UFC and 80s music along the way. Pitch concluded. Uh, audio tech. We, yeah, we look for talented people. We look for people that fit well in the community, obviously. Um, and first and foremost, we just look for people who are passionate about what we do. So, you know, I, there's, I always go by the concept, the old saying of like, um, you know, higher work ethic, teach skill. But if someone comes in with a strong work ethic and a, a, a large, a great technical background, well, that's more the merrier, you know. Uh, I also look for people that can teach me a thing or two, which is always nice. Um, because I feel like, you know, with Andy, for instance, Andy coming in, he has a great design aesthetic. It's awesome to be able to see him, um, like, make iterations of t-shirts with notes that we give him and just take that to the next level, right? Or just be pushing, really just f pushing that conversation with us of being like, hey, we should do this. Hey, we should do this. Here's a fun idea. Here's a fun idea. And it takes all the guesswork out of what we're doing. Um, so from a technical standpoint, yeah, I mean, I think you've got, you've got what it takes to work for a group like us. Um, it's just a matter of like, are we going to evolve to that need? And I hope someday we do. Next question comes from Jack Habib says, Nick, and he spelled that with all caps and an exclamation mark, which is fantastic. Uh, I have a quandary. I love both channels and I understand your willingness to take critique and feedback from your audience, but I'm never sure where to go to post the feedback I have, which leads me to my question. Where does kind of funny go when you guys want to find out what your audience thinks of your content? Um, well, Joey is now our community manager and she's everywhere. Like, she is like God. If God were really, really nice and basically put up with all the shit that I had to give her. Um, I go, I read the Reddit a lot. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of the guys read the Reddit and the forums a lot. I'll be honest, I'm the, I'm the person that's probably leads, reads the least amount of feedback, but I do love reading feedback on the actual videos themselves. So it's about a video, please put it in the comments. Um, and if there's a thread on Reddit for it, I will for sure see that. Um, if not, I'm sure Joey usually sees everything and brings it to my attention and we talk about it internally and stuff like that. So I do apologize if I don't actually get out there more to talk to people. Um, about what's going on uh, or, or the, the, the feedback that I see, but I do see a lot of it and I do try to incorporate that into what we're doing. Uh, Finn Oswald says, hey Nick, I'm super excited. This is the first time I've been able to support you guys on Patreon and believe me, I've been uh, ride or die since day one, without, only without the proper fundings. Over the years you discussed on either GOG or The Morning Show about your dream to make direct uh, a movie somewhere down the line, which brings me to my question. What kind of movie do you want to make? Action, comedy, drama, etc. I also want to say, as a huge fan of stand-up comedy, you are fucking hilarious and I can't wait to see your prog progress. Uh, P.S. You got to go on Rogan's podcast and hopefully the rest of Kind of Funny Crew too. Keep up the spectacular work. Um, I, I love movies. I do love movies. Recently, um, 
I think that uh, I, you know, stand-up comedy has taken a little bit more of a of a presence in my life, just because it's fun. It's something that I can get out there and go do, and it directly relates to what I'm doing here. So I can look at myself, you know, doing stand-up, look at myself on a panel, look at myself on the morning show, and really kind of apply all the things that I'm learning in each area to one another to get that cyclical thing. Uh, movies are going to be a different beast. Like I love movies, and I, I still write a lot. Um, I mostly write comedies. It's just I don't I don't have the energy for that right now. I think I, we're, we're pouring sort of everything into the content that we're making here and we're just having a, to be honest, we're having a fucking blast. So it's one of those things where, you know, I, I love, I love the movie making process. I love hanging out with guys like Danny Mack and the team that made um, Heel Kick. It's super inspirational for me. Um, so one day, yes, a comedy about, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. A comedy though. There it is. Um, John, no, Mario Not Bros, Pisquadio, uh, says, Hey, if it isn't Uncle Nick yourself, first, I miss you. Secondly, as you may have seen, I just got a tattoo, my first tattoo, about these fucking weird guys who are secretly an ass-eating cult. But I digress. What's a tattoo you'd want to get? Love you. Uh, Mario, I think I'd like to get a tattoo of your face right here. Looking at my face right here. So that when I do the peck dance, it looks like we're laughing at each other. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't thought much about getting tattoos. Um, I thought maybe as I progressed uh, in jujitsu belt wise, that maybe I'd get something to, to signify that because it's been an interesting and fun journey for me. Uh, but that's happening a lot slower than I thought, and I don't want to be that guy that just has a white belt tattooed on his arm for the rest of his life. So I'm also super fickle when it comes to stuff. Um, so I don't know if um, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever get a tattoo. But kudos to you, man. I, I really respect people that get tattoos because you're just like fuck it. Fuck it, you know what I mean? Let me just do it. Turn this back on just to make sure the camera's still rolling. See if the camera's still rolling. It's still rolling. Right on, right on, right on. Uh, next comes from Alex. Alex says, hey Nick, I've been, a patron. I've been a patron for a while and I get early access to GOG, but I watch the topic videos as they come out to help me break the monotony of work. Do you guys prefer patrons? Uh, take advantage of the perks so you have an idea if they are enticing enough. I think the idea of being able to view the live recording is awesome, by the way. Keep them scoops hard, my friend, Mighty Mouse. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really however you guys wanna do it. We do love feedback, right? And the whole concept of Patreon is that we're trying to provide a value above and beyond just supporting us. Of course, we love you guys supporting us. But we do wanna make stuff that like, you know, you guys actually utilize and find, um, and find entertaining. Right, so for instance, yeah, I agree with you. I fucking love that we do the podcast live now. I love seeing people there. I love that you get to tune in because obviously, like, I'm, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Joe Rogan, right? And when I can watch his podcasts live, I do. There's something certain, just kind of special about um, the podcasts and and being live and hearing those things that we probably would have to cut out uh, of the normal podcasts, but that you guys get to see because, oops, we effed up, right? Um, so, I mean, ultimately, yeah, I mean, what we want to hear is from you guys. Like, what do you guys want? What what would you guys like to see on this platform that would really be like, hey, this is a special thing? And if you have ideas about that, please let us know. Please let us know here. Please tweet at us. Let us know on the Reddit or just in the comments of videos as they come. Uh, we love you guys for that. Uh, Griffin says, hey, Nick, come September, I'm doing my first producing job at my school, a TV station for a video game game show, much like Rooster Teeth's Immersion. Do you have any tips for a longtime seducer but first time producer? Thanks and keep up the crazy, awesome work. Yes, I do. In every production, there is a time where everything goes wrong. And you go, shit, this is terrible. This is gonna be terrible, right? I don't know why I got myself into this. I don't know what I was thinking when I did this. Um, I should just go back to you know being a math major, whatever the fuck you're gonna do in college. You gotta push through that part of it. Because every production has that lull where you're like, oh, this is fucking hard and it's not coming together. It will come together, but you as the producer, your job is to make sure you take all of the little pieces and put them together properly so you make a good quality product at the end of it, okay? Don't focus on the minutia. Focus on utilizing all the tools at your disposal. Now, if you're the only person doing the thing, like producer of an online media show, like, like you know, Kevin produces our stuff, but also he does everything, um, it's a little bit harder, but if you have people working for you who are camera ops or audio engineers, um, and you have a team of people, all, what you really need to do is just focus on the high end. What's the end product? What is What are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and let everyone else do their job, and you'll be okay. Just push through that shit point, and especially if it's live tape. Every single time I've ever done a production, every single time I try to like push the envelope or do something cool or do something creative, I get that first edit back, and I'm like, this is a fucking travesty. But you just gotta push through it. You gotta push through it. 
Uh, Kenny Lamb says, hey, Uncle Nick. I live in Orange County and was able to meet you guys at Portillo's in Buena Park two years ago. Since you're uh, representing SoCal and kind of funny, I was wondering what are some of your favorite places to go and things to do here in OC SoCal. Thanks, keep up the great work, and can I please get some prints? Well, first off, Kenny Lamb. I lick my fingers there for you too, and guess what? They don't taste good. I don't know where they've been. Not in a good place. Uh, I love the OC. I love going out to uh, Fashion Island. Uh, I used, we used to take my mom out to that El Torito at the Fashion Island. Every once in a while for Mother's Day, they have an excellent brunch. All you can eat, that corn stuff, you know, that sweet corn stuff. Um, I love the Irvine Spectrum. I like just outdoor malls and walking around. That's what I love to do in Orange County. Um, and my brother lives there, of course, so I love visiting my family. Justin Jones says, hey, seducer, I'm a diehard, diehard fan. I want to know your favorite quote and favorite scene. Glass, who gives a shit about Glass? Who the fuck is this? It gone. And then he replied to his own and said, well, I messed that all up. But my favorite scene is when he's in the bathroom pulling Glass out of his foot, saying you're the best thing that ever happened to a bum like me. Um... Love the scene with uh, with Ellis where he's like, Hans, booby. You know, I love that. My brother sends that to me every once in a while when it's on. He'll just wait for that scene and he'll get, you know, he'll just he'll just record it for me. Um, I mean, I like, I always quote this and no one ever understands what I'm saying, but I'm like, I want to come out to the coast. We'll have a few drinks. We'll get together. We'll have a few laughs. You know, um, I love that scene where he's crawling through through the great or the the fucking air duct with the thing, and he's like, "Yeah, it's so good, it's so typical." But I also love the Yipikaye motherfucker scene. Yipikaye motherfucker, it's great, it's great, Die Hard, fantastic, great movie. If you haven't seen it, chickity check it out. Stop at Die Live Free or Die Hard though. Do not go to Die Hard with uh, uh, whatever the fuck. Good day to Die Hard. Don't do that. That was just. I got off the fucking rails. Jason says, hey, Uncle Nick, what are some tips for writing a script for a short film? Um, I get asked this every once in a while. I think you have to, you have to first and foremost kind of ask yourself what you're trying to accomplish with a short film, right? Shorts are very difficult. Shorts, in my opinion, like, if you're trying to make a short to stylistically prove that you can make the longer version of that, well, then you should just do, like, a slice of it, like a, a, sli a scene from whatever the longer version is. Um, just so you can get a feeling for who those actors are and what that world is. Uh, if you want to do a standalone short, then you need to follow probably uh, the th closer to the three-act structure of a longer movie, right? You need to set up, you need a little bit of development, you need, you know, um, a lot of conflict that's happening and then a resolution. So, or just have fun. I mean, the fun thing about shorts is they're experimental as well, so you can just kind of do whatever you need to do. But if you're trying to tell a story, try to hit all those story beats, right? Try to hit that. Try, try to hit that catalyst moment. Try to hit that first act turning point moment. Try to hit all those things, you know, in in whatever time span that you're looking to do them in. So if it's a 20 minute short, for instance, like okay, well then the first scene should probably have the catalyst in it. Something's happening, right? Um, things like that. I would also recommend, you know, read. I think the more you read about screenwriting structure, the better off you are because you can kind of deeply ingrain that in your in your brain. And then when you watch movies, you can sort of start to see how they utilize that structure as well. So um, obviously, the Screenwriter's Bible is great. Blake Schneider's book I just read um, about a year ago. I liked that. It's called Save the Cat. It kind of breaks it down for you as well. Um, there's a ton of books out there like Sid Fields and all those guys that kind of really break down how they structure screenplays. And so I think once you have that knowledge, um, it's just cool to sort of see how they do it, how different people do it, and you can apply it to your own work. I'm a Greg Miller guy says, hey Nick, quick hypothetical for you. All of the kind of funny crew are hanging off the side of a very tall building. They all need your imp uh, impressive body strength to bring them up to safety, but you can only choose two members to keep uh, the kind of funny legacy going. Who are those two lucky uh, people going to be? Um, I don't know who I would, I can't answer that question. I would try to save whoever I can because I'm a fucking ride and die motherfucker. Okay, first off, I don't accept that there's only two people I can save. Okay, what would Superman do? I would just fucking punch harder. I'll save everyone. Okay, but if I had to let one person die, just think about that for a second. His name rhymes with Blevin. I'm just kidding. I love you, Kevin. I would never let you die, brother. I would never let you die, brother. Uh, da, 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 da. Alexander Peter Preston says, Hey, Nick, I've been a huge fan of you ever since up at noon. Uh, the days when you kept getting more and more hilarious every single day. The stand-up that you guys released on the live stream leading to Kind of Funny Live 3 had me dying laughing. This is the kind of random, but if you have to remove one movie from the up-and-coming Marvel uh, slate and push 
Another movie up in the timeline, what would it be? The current Marvel slate is as follows. Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, uh, Avengers Infinity War, Ant-Man and Wasp, Captain Marvel, uh, Untitled Avengers film, Untitled Spider-Man Homecoming sequel, and The Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'll tell you the ones I don't care about. I don't really give a shit about another Ant-Man. I love Paul Rudd. He's great. I don't really care about Black Panther. I don't think a lot of people do. It's just that I didn't care for that character in Civil War, and I don't really... I don't really need that character. Thor Ragnarok looks fucking amazing, and obviously I want to see what they're doing with Infinity War. So I would take out Black Panther, Ant-Man, uh, Captain Marvel. Uh, uh, I like Brie Larson, but do we care? Do we need that? Do we need another character? Are we going into Phase 15? I don't know. I don't know. Let's just get to the Avengers and Spider-Man. Give me what I want. Uh, Jamie Lanham says, Hey, Nick, just wanted to say hello, and then I really think uh, you've come out of your shell more the past year. I can tell you that you have more... Confidence in uh, yourself since you've been doing jujitsu, therapy, and stand up. Really proud of the full Nick you're becoming. You're also very inspiring as far as eating healthy and trying to adapt to a better lifestyle. You guys, as a whole, were a strong motivator and quit smoking and me quitting smoking last year in December. And because I quit, I was able to afford attending Kind of Funny Live 3 and meet you guys in person. That's what I'm talking about. Um, thanks for the inspiration. Question What kind of pep talk do you give yourself when life just seems like too much? How do you convince yourself that the struggle is worth it uh, when it feels hopeless a lot? I struggle with finding meaning in life, even though I have some good people around me from the outside. Most would think I should be happy. Any advice? Much love. Yeah, I have plenty of advice on the subject, um, and I think jujitsu is a great analogy. I look at jujitsu as sort of a, a, you know, a matrix through which I can view life. Matrix is a very po- that, that's a strong word. I don't like that word, matrix. I guess. I like to take the lessons that I t- that I take like I learn in jiu-jitsu and apply them to life. And namely, one of the reasons why I push so hard for it is because there's a lot of places, like a lot of situations in jiu-jitsu where you just physically, like you just can't get out of, right? And we have the saying where you just have to get comfortable being uncomfortable for however long that's going to take, right? There are just certain spots or certain people that can hold you down or they can hold you in different spots. Or they can, you know, basically do whatever they want to you um, because they have way more technique and way more experience and you just have to be okay with that. Um, and I think that's really hard for me and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I have I have triggers like claustrophobia, things that, that happen because I just can't, like w- one of the reasons why I have that anxiety going in is because I just can't deal with not being in control, like not being able to have something bad happen to me and me not be able to immediately fix it. Um, but the thing I love about jiu-jitsu is that every time you go in, that's gonna happen. It's just gonna happen. Someone's gonna put you in a spot that you can't get out of um, and so the only thing really you can do is get comfortable being there or, um, you know, until you get tapped or the person or, you know, the buzzer hits. But ultimately, you know, there are just, there are just situations in jiu-jitsu where you can't win. And so you have to understand that. And you have to know that you're going to go in there and you might be in one of those situations and that's just going to be okay. Because eventually, um, either you're going to tap or the buzzer's going to hit or the person's going to let you up and you're going to reset and you're going to get another chance to try again. And guess what? That next time you do try again... Or you roll with someone new and you actually, you know, get a submission or, you know, you get a better position on that person than you had before. Um, it makes it ever, it, like, it makes it even better, right? It's, 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 it's kind of, it's, it's, it's just heightened by the fact that the one that came before it was so bad. And so that, if you start looking through life, at life through that lens, um, then I think, I think it's a lot easier to deal with because you start realizing that, oh shit, you know, life kind of sucks right now and I'm in a little bit of a downward slope, but, um, all that means is that the second I start to come back up, and it inevitably will come back up because, you know, if you're motivated and you're doing cool shit like quitting smoking, you're kind of, that's kind of a life three, you're trying new stuff. Um, so eventually you're going to go back up and it's going to be awesome. Um, but you just got to know that, um, you know, you just got to know that the more cool stuff that you try, the harder the stuff's going to get and the more challenges you're going to face. So you just have to be okay being in those weird spots and just letting letting that moment in your life happen to you just and, and know and have confidence in yourself that you're going to get through it and you're going to push forward to the newer the better stuff. Uh, Robert Robert says, "Hey champ, as the undisputed longest reigning kind of funny world champion, how do you deal with all the pressure that comes with holding the belt uh, and how do you stay so humble uh, maintaining the title for as long as you have?" Well, at this point, I just feel like everyone's scared of me. I feel like Greg specifically is just a giant vagina, you know. And then I think that he'll never uh, he'll never get the belt back. He knows it. He doesn't even want to challenge me for the belt back, to be perfectly honest, because he just he's he's lost so many times that he's. I mean, at this point, we'll just call him a loser, right? Right, Kev? <laughs> we just got to call him the big loser. So I don't know. Uh, do I feel pressure to keep the belt still? 
I mean, the belt means a lot to me, but I've gone, I've moved on with my life. The belt's always going to be there. I'll always be the best champ. Uh, they, they call me the goat. I don't know what that means. Um, I think it's because I eat a lot of weird shit, um, but that's just what they refer to me as now. So I guess I'll just be the goat forever. Uh, Nicole says, "Hey Nick, the kind of funny crew insists that you have a bad that you have insists that you have bad movie taste, but I sense that you are like me and that you see the value in even the worst films. What are some of your favorite diamonds in the rough films? Uh, here are a few of mine: Ghostbusters 2, League of, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. That is an extraordinarily rough film, and Jack Frost 2, Revenge of the Mutant Killer Snowman in the Caribbean. Admittedly, admittedly that last one is straight up terrible, but it is very fun to watch with friends and laugh at. Much love always." Um, I am with you, right? Where I, if I'm ever being critical of a film, um, it's generally just because I like being critical of a film. That doesn't mean there aren't some amazing things to find in that. And just personally, I don't like, you know, I've been in those mindsets and I've been in those places in life where um, I feel like, you know, you want to hate on stuff. And it's just a bad place to be at. It's just super negative. It's inherently just not a fun thing to do. So I like to try to find the positive in, it, in everything. My brain just stopped working. I like to try to find the positive aspects of everything because I think then you can just go forward and enjoy a lot more stuff, right? If there's one element of a film that throws you off and you don't like it and you're like, oh, this is terrible, then you're not going to like anything. Um, I have my criticisms, of course, but there are movies that I just kind of, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's, there's like three categories of movies that I always say, right? There's just plain old-fashioned, terribly made, bad movies. Then there's like movies that are bad but super enjoyable, and I think that's the biggest category for me. Because not everything can be Last of the Mohicans and like, you know, Dances with Wolves and Hunt for October and like Room and like all these Academy Award winning films. Like, I don't know, that's so much energy you invest in those. I like this middle category more where it's like, this is the category of like the Fast and the Furious and Daddy's Home and, and Dirty Grandpa movies where it's like, just go in knowing what they are and just appreciate them and have fun. Um, Recently, what have I been watching a lot lately? I mean, obviously movies like Big Trouble in Little China, like that movie everyone says is terrible, but I love that fucking film. And that to me is just like, that's my guilty pleasure. Pretty much anything John Carpenter is my guilty pleasure. Uh, Andrew says, a while ago, you had your therapist on for a one-on-one -on -one talking about the various issues you have been working through. How are things going with that? My wife and I hope it is all going well. Also, I think uh, you're my wife's favorite on Kind of Funny. She frequently rocks the producer slash producer shirt. Uh, this is from Andrew and Emma. And he had a little smiley face. Uh, things are going well. Things are going well. I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's a process, but I've been, like I said before, taking a lot of the tools that I've learned there that I've applied to jiu-jitsu and applying them across the board. So any you know, and all nervousness or anxiety that I have going into things like stand-up comedy, I'm able to sort of ease, more easily overcome um, because of the techniques that I'm learning in jiu-jitsu. So that's, I mean, that's, it's going well. It's going very well. And it's been true, overall, it's been a difficult process, but very, very positive. And so I, you know, I'd like to push anyone out there that's thinking about talking to someone, definitely talk to someone. Like, you, you know, only positive things can come when you when you put that out there when you, when you try to do those things like it might be rough and it might be it might be hard in the short term but in the long term you're gonna get a, a lot of value out of it um, Anthony another Anthony says hey Nick hope your day is going well have you ever watched the show skins I believe you would really enjoy it and I highly recommend it it's a British comedy drama with amazing character development the first season stars Nicholas Holt Dave Patel from Slump Dog Millionaire and Hannah Murray from Game of, Murray from Game of Thrones give it a shot if you haven't already I'll put it on the list. Appreciate that. Uh, AG says, no question. Just wanted, uh, just was waiting for my favorite kind of funny member to host one of these so I can say thanks for all the great content and all the work you guys do. As someone who struggles with anxiety, amongst other things, the one, uh, the one on one episode you did with your therapist was amazing to listen to, and I ended up taking a lot away from the podcast. Keep being awesome, guys, and thanks again. I appreciate that, AG, and I'm glad that worked. Um, that was that was the point of that. The point of that was to make sure that people out there. You know, if you were if you didn't if you weren't aware that that was something you could utilize, or if you were on the fence about it, to just see what that process might look like and understand that it could be very very positive. So I'm glad you got something out of that, and I hope um, I hope you're doing okay. Demetria says, "Hey Nick, what kind of equipment would you recommend for a starting podcast? Uh, for starting a podcast, my girlfriend Rihanna and I have thought about playing around with the idea, but don't know where we should start with equipment. Thanks in advance for advice. Love you and kind of funny. Um." Really, the only thing you need for a podcast is you need uh, a soundboard, some mics, and a recording device. And it doesn't really matter what you have there. We used to use the AT2020s by Audio Technica for our mics, and we used to use a Yamaha soundboard. Uh, so you can go back and watch the first few episodes of GOG. You can hear what that sounds like. Um, and we were going straight into a camera 
uh, that we bought, which is actually the camera that I'm using right now, which is a C100, but you don't need anything that big. You can go straight into a prosumer level camera and probably get exactly what you need and out of it if you want to make a video podcast. If it's audio only, you can get an H6, H6 recorder. I want to say H264, but that's a file format. H6, I think, is what it is. Um, and those are great. You can plug into there. You get little levels and you just hit record and you're ready to rock and roll. Um, if you want to go a little higher end, you can look in, get into getting sound boards that have some built-in compression in them. Um, like we have a really nice Behringer soundboard uh, and we use Sennheiser mics, uh, but you don't have to go that high end, especially when you're just starting out. Just get what, I'll tell you what, get whatever is the path of least resistance and go have fun. That's the point. Have fun. Uh, Cameron says, hi Nick. So with your newly revealed stand-up skills, are you asking, are you asked to take part in a comedy celebrity? Okay. So with your newly released stand-up skills, you're asked to take part in a comedy celebrity roast. Who would you want to be roasting and who would you want alongside of you uh, to take part? Honestly, I love the roasts. I would, I would just want to watch Anthony Jeselnik roast people. He is fucking hilarious and his roasts are so brutal that I feel like he would be, um, yeah, he'd be a good guy to do that too. Uh, as far as roasting celebrities, I don't know. I, I'm not one for roasting things. Again, I don't really like to do that. I don't like to go negative. And if I am going to go negative, I try to be a little bit more, um, you know, negative against myself. Um, just because I just, yeah, who the fuck am I? What the fuck am I going to roast someone? But I feel like there's an art to the roasts. There's like a, I mean, there's a definite fun factor to it, especially when the person is a good is like taking it well. That you just get to go like you get to go into that super fucked up part of your brain and do that. But I just don't know if I'm capable of it. But I will watch it and I will laugh at it. And I will that doesn't does that make me a terrible person? Maybe maybe it makes me a terrible person. But it's funny. And they say laughter is the best medicine. So I'm gonna live for a fucking long time, dog. A long time. Oh um, oh two more. Uh, Steve says, what's, uh, hi Nick, what's up Steve, uh, he says, what's a film that you wish you could have been on set while they were filming and why? You're the best champ. Oh man, I would have fucking paid to go back to the 89 Batman and be on set when that was happening. Even if I was nine, I'd been like, that would have been amazing just to see how they filmed that and see Michael Keaton in the suit, see all that going on. Um, I would have also loved to have been on the set of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I think that would have been a really fun vibe. Um, and then, of course, Ghostbusters. I think just watching those guys shoot any of those scenes would be really cool. It'd be awesome to see to, to see what it was like working with, you know, having like Ivan Reitman direct Harold Ramis, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd uh, in a scene together. Like the scene where they're going up the elevator, right? I don't know. Just all, all that stuff would be, and they're like, let's turn it on. And they go, oh. I don't know. I think all that stuff would be fun. Any, any of those really 80s movies that I have a nostalgia for, I would have loved to have been a part of those. Um, just to see what it would have been like, really just to go to the after party and see what, see how much snow was coming from the rafters, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about cocaine. Last question for this AMA comes from Angel Cruz. Angel says, hi, boy. Hi, Nikki boy. You sexy son of a bitch. Beautiful, respectable woman. How are you? Good? Great. As a youngling, just turned 18, I've grown up in a world where YouTube is my main source of entertainment, with you guys being one of my most watched, listened to every day. I feel, because of YouTube and other creative outlets, me, as well as other people that have grown up in with this wild, wild west of independent creators of music, fan-made films, podcasts, video games, and everything else under the sun, uh, have seen we don't need a transitional job, and we can do what we do, uh, what we want to do. Do you think... A creative renaissance is currently happening or about to happen because of all the people that have grown up watching others do amazing things and making a living doing so. I'm interested in starting my own podcast, YouTube, Twitch channel, but I have little experience and not a lot of money to drop on equipment because of college. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to school for film, film production, and editing, writing, and radio broadcast because I know I want to, be, want to create and entertain in the future, but I feel the creative burn to start doing something now. Any advice on equipment and tools I should use to start? Any advice on starting itself? Uh, thank you, Nick, for your time. I'm so sorry for such a long message. This is why I only write in every couple, in, write in every couple of months because I know it's going to be long. P.S. Please, for the love of God, give me a sweet, nasty butthole. Keep on seducing. Um, yeah, I have a lot of advice for you, and I wish. And this is advice I wish I had that someone had given me. Um, perfect is the enemy of good. So. Whatever device you used 
to write this in. Maybe it was a computer, maybe it was a cell phone. If it has a camera on it, start making content with that right now. Don't be that guy that goes, I have to wait for the perfect camera and the perfect audio and the perfect thing and the perfect this and the perfect that to go make this content because what you're really doing, all you're really doing is uh, you're shielding yourself from the inevitable thing you're gonna have to do which is actually figure out what that content's gonna be. And the best way to figure out what that content's gonna be is just by doing it. Right? I know that sounds crazy because a lot of people want to go, hey, I got to make sure this is perfect and come out of the gates perfect, but guess what? We're coming up on 200 episodes of our podcast and we still haven't figured out what the fuck that show is going to be. So, you know, at a certain point, you just got to fix the ship while it's in the air. Having said that, having an idea of what you want to do is good, but a lot of people start with vlogging, right? A lot of people just start with their thoughts or whatever's going on so they can just get that creativity out in the world. And I always say this, I always say there's no, there's no such thing as wasted creativity. Even if one person watches your vlog, I mean, it's just your friend who just checks in for a second. That's practice that you got. That's creativity that you put out into the world, and that's fantastic. Um, so don't get caught up on, you know, don't don't get caught up on saying like I have to do the traditional route because I absolutely agree with you. There is a renaissance happening, and guess what? Films as we know it have evolved so much over the last ten years because of that. Uh, content generation, content creation, content delivery has totally changed in the last ten years. And so what's popular now, and what you might spend the next 10 to 15 years trying to get into might not be popular when you get into it. And if you have the yearning to do content right now and to do Twitch, you know, Twitch stream and uh, to make YouTube videos or podcasts or do all this stuff, just start doing it. Just start doing it, but keep your eye, be strategic. Obviously don't do it over and over and over again and just never fucking tell people about it or never try to get people on it or never try to grow it. But the best way to learn anything is by doing it. And if you, if you want to be successful, the number one tool you have to develop, and this is something I've learned specifically over the last two years, is you really, really, really need to get good at just doing it, right? Like planning accordingly so you, don't, so you have a decent project, but then boom, just go fucking do it. Go do it. Be the kind of person that executes. Because that was my biggest problem for so long, was that I would plan, 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 and then I would get to a certain point where I'm like, am I planning because I want this project to be perfect, or am I planning because I'm too scared to actually or, or too frightened of actually going out there and executing and maybe it failing, right? But guess what? You're going to fail. First couple ones, probably are going to suck. You might suck for a year. It doesn't matter. Get that out of the fucking way as soon as humanly possible. Keep doing it. Keep going back and doing more and more and more of it. And then eventually, failure is not failure anymore. Failure is just a little less success than you had on the one that's coming next, if that makes sense. So, you know, they always say failure is a, a perfect tool. I don't even believe in failure. I don't like the concept of failure. I think there are just things that are successful and things that are less successful in your life. And that's just the way it goes. And if you think of it in terms of that, then you're already behind. Just start, start doing it now. Why not, right? Why not? There you go. You wanted it. You got it. Um, I'm sorry. You asked for a sweet, nasty bunghole. I'll give you one of those too. Bunghole. That was uh, a little Beavis and Butthead for you. I'm sure you don't know what the hell I'm talking about because you're very young. You just turned 18. I think you turned 18. You probably were born three years after Beavis and Butthead. This last episode aired. You were probably born after Beavis and Butthead Do America was a thing. I'm going to look that up right now, actually. You know, while well, I got you, why don't we just look this up? You were, you're 18 years old, which means you were born in 1999, right? Beavis and Butthole. Do America was in 1996. So you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But it's a cool essay. Because that's what I'm here for. I'm here as your cultural tie to all those things from the early 90s and late 80s that you don't give a fuck about. But I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for all of your support on Patreon. We can literally not do this without you. You guys are the glue that holds this whole community together and we love you so much. Um, We'll be back next, I don't know who's next month, but uh, Joey will let you guys know. Until then, stay classy on this here, the Patreons. Bye.